Refuge Church. Good evening. Good evening. God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. Good, good. So I had a couple of things I actually wanted to say before, and I completely forgot. I was had my mind very much focused on Rose, to be honest. So, um, but um, now of course we're fleeting. Um, oh, so you may have noticed last week, and again this week, um, our offering box is not up front anymore. <laughs> Um, we have a table back there now, um, offering and literature and connect cards and prayer request forms are all on a table back there, so um, whether you do it before or after, um, if you're interested. Um, we also maybe have the next week uh, some Bibles, if you don't have a Bible um, and you're in need of one, please let us know. Um, we would definitely love to provide you with a Bible, God's Word. Um, if you don't have one for tonight, you'll find one in the seat back in front of you. So, and there are two on, there's two of them. Oh, okay. There's two of them also on the back table. So if you don't have a Bible to bring home with you to read the Word of God, um, and to kind of reference what we're talking about tonight, um, I encourage you to grab one of them. They're free to take. Take one home. Um, I actually say that, um, because to me, growing up in a, a Christian family and, and in private school and Christian church, and I mean, we get a Bible as part of our curriculum books every year. So... I really take for granted this, as horrible as that's the sound, that everybody has a Bible. Like, what are you talking about, right? And yet, um, one day here at church, um, maybe it was late last year, beginning, beginning of this year, I had somebody come up to me and say, uh, Pastor Mark, I don't have a Bible. And I was almost shocked, right? Like, what? <laughs> um, and we were able to provide her this one. So I just want to make sure everybody knows that they are available and we will have more available if you need one. And if you don't, to ask. Okay? So this week... Um, as I was just going about my week, I actually started a new devotional, um, and it talked about uh, the different names that God has in Scripture. And um, I was thinking about that all week, and it's so amazing. Um, and one of those names, I actually, if you read it or got the email, shared in our newsletter. <laughs> but uh, no, so out of all seriousness, I did share one of them in, in our newsletter, and it's uh, Jehovah Shalom. And it's, God of, uh, and it's not just God of peace. It means the Lord is peace, right? And, uh, and you can read that in there, but it, it really is that the Lord is not just where we find peace. He's not just the guy who gives us peace, but he is the essence of what peace is, right? And that is the God that we serve. Like, how awesome is that? Um, it's not that he just calms storms, but, but he is the calm in the storm. And so I was thinking about that this week, and... Um, I was going through all these these things in my head, and then, as our week was going on, um, some things happened. Maybe you guys may be aware of. Um, our sister, Wendy, had some things going on in her life this week with her car. Um, for everyone who don't know, um, if you don't mind me sharing, Wendy, I'm sure you don't. <laughs> um, but uh, her car, the engine blew up. I'm probably to see her parents. And we were praying for her to go see her parents, and that happened. And we don't know why God lets these things happen, um, but that happened, right? Um, and then we also, I also got a call from our brother Bob this week, and his his grandson had a spike of fever, right? And we were praying for him, and I'll give a quick update on that because I didn't earlier. I'm sorry, Bob, but um, Bob let me know later the next day, the next morning, um, that right after he had texted us, shortly after that, and we went into prayer for him for this little boy um, that. Between him going to the urgent care and get rushed to the ER, right, Bob? Yeah. Um, his temperature went down wow. from 104 to like 102, 101, or, and, and continued down the trend. And it turned out that he had an ear infection. Mm -hmm. I'm a firm believer that little boy did not go to uh, urgent care with an ear infection, but he came home with just an ear infection. And, and in my opinion, that is the power of prayer, the power of corporate prayer, and how what happens when we put our trust in God. Um, you know, and then it was compounded further as that update came in for Rose, and, and we hear what she's going through, and, and all these things are happening. And then my own life, and I shared a little bit last week, how I was coming under attack for, for things that I'm doing, as many of you are aware of, um, some of the steps I'm taking that the Lord directed me into, and I came into personal and public attack for things. And uh, I've been praying for that. And, and all of that, being presented with opportunities to recognize that the Lord answers prayers, being willing to 
Uh, be obedient to utilize the answer to trust God in those prayers, even when we don't see it, right? Even when it seems like the more we pray, um, nothing's going on, but God's always up to something <laughs> um, in the background. But then also how it's up to us to utilize the answer in prayer that he gives us. And, and I had a wonderful answer to prayer in mind as well um, in, in my circumstance that the Lord provided a person that I needed to help manage some of these things that I've got going on. Um, and I reached out to a brother in Christ in Cleveland and, and he had reached out to his wife and they reached out to their daughter and, and she's teaming up with us and it was like the perfect answer to prayer there. But yet, you know, as we're going through the circumstance and going through the, the need of things, we get caught up in what's going to happen next. And, and how are these needs going to be met? And where is the provision going to come from, right? And that's where I'm going with this. In all of this came this idea of provision. And, um, and I'll share a little more with what Wendy shared with me. And, and um, her provision is, is through her car going. And, and that, that thing that happened, she had shared that, yet she was able to go to where she, she raised her boys and sit down and find, find some peace with the Lord. And just sit there and experience his presence. Um, and sometimes we need to be forced in whatever way to stop and be still and know that he is God. Right? Just as Rose is going through her things and however the Lord is going to provide provision there, there's somebody in that hospital, there's somebody in that family that needs to see the strength and the blessing of the Lord. And so we come into this idea of provision and, and how we understand or even perceive what provisions are in 2023, we understand them very different than they do in other parts of the world. I often say America, and I have to correct myself because it's really just the Western world in general, right? Um, this idea of provisions when we go on a trip and we say, well, we're going to gather provisions together and go on a trip, right? It's, it's a lot different. Then in the 1800s, when they were gathering provisions to go out west, right? Um, or when the people in Africa needed provisions of food, right? And I say Africa because you know, it comes to mind with our partners, partners in, uh, or those that have ministry partnering with in Uganda. Um, you know, I was talking to Pastor Terry today, he's the pastor over there. And he was telling me how they have a need for an, a widow to have a house built. She's an older widow. She has no home. You know, and how are they going to provide provisions? Not just financially, but the wood, the nails. <laughs> um, it's not exactly easy to run down to the local Home Depot and buy a box of nails and a, and a, a pallet of wood to go build, right? We had um, a platform built this week to put a shed on. And, you know, this truck came up in front of my house with his crane attached to the back, and he hopped in it and brought it down and picked up pallets, dropped them in my driveway, and away he went, right? And we take for granted how easy it is in such a land of plenty, how easy it is to go to shopping, how easy it is to go to Home Depot, how easy it is to go to CVS when we're sick to go get medicine, right? And I think sometimes... We get disconnected um, with the idea of provision that not just disconnected, but the word has almost become weightless to us, right? Like it's, we're numb to it. Much like I've said in the past with the words like love and hate in our society, right? We love our car. We love our house. We love our kids. We love our dog. Now, obviously we love them all in different ways, but in America, love is, is just that word and, and we use it for everything. Um, whether it's important or probably silly, right? Um, and so we also use hate the same way. Oh, I hate this, this, this car that I have. And, and yet, while you're hating your car, there's somebody who's in very much need of a car, right? Um, I remember I used to think driving down the road, um, I had a 1983 Ford Bronco as my first car. Um, complete with an 8-track player, by the way. So yes, at 42, I do know what 8-tracks are. And my dad gave me a box of them on the day that, again, that I got my car. Um, so I definitely know what they are. But um, I remember driving that truck, you know, nine miles to the gallon if I was lucky. Um, and at some point before I got rid of it, 
There was this time that I made a hard left turn and I looked in my rearview mirror and I literally watched a metal component go bouncing down the road after I made a sharp turn. And I remember driving down the highway that day going, looking at these people driving by with these newer cars going, man, I hate this car. I hate this car. And then I remember I get to where I was going and it was raining that day and I get to where I'm going and I see somebody hoofing it down Route 1 in the rain, no umbrella, probably looking at my junky old 83 Bronco going, man, I wish I had that car, right? Um, so there's definitely moments that these words do impact us in a very real way, um, such as when a loved one is facing a dire situation or we're facing huge obstacles. Um, but in our daily lives, we see the Lord meeting needs in very frivolous ways, right? Like, oh, the Lord, Lord provided for us to get that upgraded TV this week. Which is great. I mean, that's a great blessing. Don't get me wrong. Praise God that he provides that way. But it's a diff very different provision. So all of this to say, um, a name of God that covers all of this that we may not think about is Jehovah Jab Jireh. Or as Hebrew it would be Yahweh Jireh. Um, as put in by Abraham. And it literally means the God who provides. Um, and this isn't a frivolous provision. This is a provision um, that, as we're going to see, comes in uh, ways when he asks heavy things from us. And we're going, Lord, what do you mean you want me to give that up? And in the background, he's already provided for you to give that up. It's in ways that he asks you um, or, or puts you in a place that you're going, Lord, why did you put me in this place? And he provides a way for you in that place, right? So the first place, we're going to look at three different places tonight. And um, I'm going to do my best to be brief with these. Um, I was told now that um, I've been ordained in the Baptist ministry that I have to say it's going to be brief while adding an hour on to my sermon. Um, <laughs> but I promise I won't. Um, out, of, out, of, out of all seriousness, no. I want to take a brief moment to look at three different instances in Scripture um, that I think we really need to remember. Um, and some of these ones are ones we may know, and some of them may be ones that we know, but we often don't think about or read. And the first one is... is God will provide when he asks us to be obedient, right? No matter what the obedient thing is. And the first place we're going to be is Genesis 22. And if you want to get there, go ahead. And um, whether your Bible's in your phone, what an awesome use of technology right now. Um, or a Bible in front of you, you can. But we're going to be in Genesis 22. And it's the first time that we see God referred to as Jehovah Jireh or Yahweh Jireh um, here in the book of Genesis. And it's within the account of Abraham. And right now in, Abra in Genesis 22, what's going on is God has told Abraham, and it's very interesting the way God asks Abraham here, um, but it's where Abraham asks that he take his son Isaac and he goes to the mountain and he sacrifices him. We've talked about the story once before in a different context, but it's interesting the way God tells Abraham here to sacrifice his son. He says, Abraham, I want you to take your son. You know, your only son. You know, your beloved son. It's like he's, he's telling Abraham, remember that son that you asked for, that I gave you, that I told you all the stars in the sky, your people were going to be birthed out of, yeah, I'm gonna take, I want you to take him and go to the mountain and use him as a sacrifice. And then I want to point out another thing, if you're reading, or reading along, is it says next that Abraham got up and went. He didn't question God. He didn't say, God, but you told me, right? How many times have we stuck there in that? But Lord, what do you mean? You told me that this was going to, you told me my family would be, you told me you would, right? He didn't give any fight. It says Abraham got the stuff together. I'm paraphrasing, of course. Um, but it says Abraham got the supplies together and the people, right? Because he went with servants to help carry stuff. And then they went. He set off. He grabbed his son. He went up to, to obey God. Does that mean that Abraham went, eh, he's just one, I'll get another one? No, it's not what that means. Do we even think that maybe even Abraham went, there ain't no way the Lord's going to make me do this, so I'm just going to go and do it. And he expected a lamb or a ram to be out there waiting? No, that's not what happened. What Abraham ex expected here was that he was going to sacrifice his son. And that the Lord, the God that he served, was going to raise his son back up to life. That's what Abraham expected. 
That's what Abraham counted on. But we see in Genesis 22, uh, I say 7 through 8, I'm going to quote part of it. At one point, as they're walking up this mountain, Isaac turns and asks his father. Pretty much, he says, hey, Dad, listen, I see all the elements for sacrifice. But I don't see anything to sacrifice. <laughs> What's going on? And Abraham says this, and I quote some verse 8. It says, Abraham answered him, saying, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering. Abraham said, God will provide. I don't think there's for one second that even when Abraham knew or, or believed that Isaac would be raised, that his heart wasn't breaking. That his heart wasn't just being torn to shreds right now, right? What envisions me, if you've ever had them, if you haven't, they're downstairs right now because Jennifer's going to use them to, to do the, the meal she cooked. But they have these claws that you can buy that shred meat. And I can just see that happening to Abraham's heart. Right? Because how hard is it, even when we have to discipline a child, to have to do the discipline process, right? How hard is it for us to sit there and cause our children pain, right? Knowing that it's going to hurt them, even if it's for their own good. I know for me, as many of you as you know, that I grew up and uh, I spent 10 years down a path of addiction. And I knew it killed my parents every day to have to say no to me. I knew it killed my mom to have to cut me off. I, know, I knew it killed my dad to be faced with the possibility of telling me I wasn't welcome there. But it was for my own good, right? He knew it would hurt, but it was for what would be better for me in the long run, right? And so here Abraham is facing this situation. Um, and the reason why I say that Abraham knew or, or believed that God would raise him up because if we look into the New Testament in Hebrews 11, it confirms for us there, it says that Abraham acted in faith that God would raise Isaac. So that brings us to another point of God's provision in our lives is not only did he provide a way out, or not a way out, but not only did he provide um, a way for Abraham to go, that was not the way that Abraham saw Right, And that's the other point is even when God provides for us that it's not always in our plan. It's not always in our way. And so when we try to go ahead and help God, because it's not going the way we envisioned it, as I've said many times before, there's something in the process of provision that God wants us to be obedient to so that he can pour down his blessings the way he sees fit, not the way we see. Right? When we do it our way, trust me, you may never know it until the next side of glory. But when you do it your way, you may end at the same result God had planned for you. But you missed a blessing from A to B. Let me promise you that right now. You may have obtained the ultimate goal, but there was many blessings to that ultimate goal that you may have missed on the way there. Right? It's like taking two different ways to a place. You may get to that same place before, but one place may have had a bathroom to stop at, and one place may not have. And Jen knows all about that because she's a firm believer that there should be a porta potty on every corner. <laughs> and honestly, as I'm getting older, I, I don't disagree with her anymore. Um, but even in all of that, right? He, Abraham gives us a great example of all of this. Um, and he gives an example of one other thing that I want to bring up in history, and we'll move on. Um, Abraham never ever through this whole thing and even afterwards he never landed on what he had to sacrifice he never landed on the heartache he would go through he never landed on or focused on poor woe is me look at what I've got to be faced with and this is where it is. Abraham gave that example in Genesis twenty-two fourteen, 14. And it says that, so Abraham called the place, the mountain where this happened, this anonymous mountain at this point, Abraham called the place, the Lord will provide. He didn't focus on what he had to sacrifice. He focused on the God that provided for what he needed in the moment. 
So when we're faced with that, that question where God says, I want you to be obedient here. I know that you have to sacrifice this, that, or the other. I know it's going to hurt. I know it's going to cause disruption. I know that it may cause your life a little more stumble. But we're obedient to him. When we focus on the provision that he's going to provide for us in the face of obedience. That's where the blessing is. That's where the joy comes from, right? Not just being happy because of what's happening, but being joyful in spite of what's happening. And that's what Abraham focused on here. It's a subtle connection to God, or there is a subtle connection to God providing a place of preparation like we talked about last week. It was on a mountain, right? And there's that subtle connection to God providing a place of preparation for us. On the mountain that he provide, that he places provisions for us, right? Preparation and provision, they're very closely connected. The second place we're going to look at that this is, is 1 Corinthians 10, 13. And actually, it'll be 1 Corinthians 10, 13, as well as Genesis 39. So if you guys want to earmark both of those or... Don't dog ear. You're going to kill me if she heard me tell you to do that. She's a librarian for those that don't know. So dog earring does not happen in our house. To her books. <laughs> I tell Annabeth to dog ear all the time and I get a glare, but it's okay. So anyway, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There's a misconception of scripture um, is that somewhere it tells us that God will never give us more than we can handle. And I'm sorry to tell you, for anyone that believes that and tells people that, that is not in our Bible. It's just not. Because I'm going to tell you what, there is nothing you can handle on your own. Nothing. There, you couldn't get out of bed on your own if you wanted to, right? I know I can't. Everybody I've talked to, we can't even wake up without God filling our lungs with the air we need to breathe. However, it does say in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that God will not let us be tempted beyond what we can bear, and that what that when we are tempted, I quote, He will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. That's what God tells us. So God gives us provision in temptation. God gives us provision in the moments in our lives when the enemy is there trying to lead us astray, whispering. I know for me, as I said earlier about addiction, when he whispers to me, hey, Mark, wouldn't it be easier to just drop a pill right now? Remember how good it felt when you swallowed that pill and 15 minutes later you knew everything would be okay? You know what the enemy never whispers in my ear? Remember how it felt to crash? Remember how it felt to throw up because you took too many? Remember how horrible you felt? Remember when you couldn't eat and you were 145 pounds and skin and bones? Remember when you lost your family and your children and your parents? And he never reminds you about that part. But God provides a way for us through temptation. Last week, as I said earlier, I, I spoke about some of these vile and dishonest things that were being said about me on Facebook. And let me tell you, before Christ Mark, ho, 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 boy, he was stirring. Because I'm going to tell you, before Christ Mark would have wanted to rip somebody's head off and would have loaded every grammatical gun I had and just lit that person up on Facebook to embarrass them, to rip them apart, to belittle them. And that's nothing I'm proud of. I'm just trying to give a, con a contrast here between before Christ mm -hmm. and the work that he does in our lives to be, be who we are, to believe in the cr cross that he died on. Yes. And so I'm giving a contrast. I am not proud of myself in any of the ways I acted. I often go back to that cross to ask for forgiveness for that. Um, but before Christ, Mark wanted to lash out and lash out harsh. The before Christ mark wanted to respond with that tongue lashing, right? However, as I took a deep breath and allowed the Spirit to speak through me, the Spirit went, I told you not to look. I told you, you know, it was none of your business what they put on their page. Because it's not. It's none of my business what they have to say. 
But he provided a way out through Facebook. Because Facebook has this wonderful utility, this wonderful tool, and it's called block. And I went in there and I blocked them. So that even if I had the temptation to throw in the search bar or something, it didn't even pop up. And God provided a way through the temptation for me. And going into Genesis 39, I want to give an example through Scripture. And it's the account of Joseph. We all know Joseph. He was the one that was given the multicolored coat by his dad. And when he did, he went to his brothers um, and bragged about how wonderful this coat he was and this vision he had that they would be bowing down to him. And whatever made this young man think that was a good idea is beyond me. Um, I'll be honest, I have brothers. Luckily, I'm the oldest. <laughs> so, uh, but I'll tell you, if any of my little brothers came up to me bragging about how I'd be bowing down to them, um, I pray it probably would have sold them. Um, but a beating and a drop in a hole may have happened. I'll just be honest. Uh, but anyway, Joseph uh, bragged to his brothers, and they, they did. They sold him into slavery. It's a horrible thing that they did to him. And, um, but along this route, they sold him into slavery, and he became um, a servant at a man Potiphar's home. And during this time as a servant, he grew to be the most favored in that house. That um, he, was, he was the model, the model servant. I don't want to say employee because he was not an employee. Uh, but he was provided for. He was well taken care of. He was named um, you know, alongside the master, really, over the other servants. Um, but in that, in the blessing that came from the Lord providing or, or pulling him out of the circumstances he, he was in, Potiphar's wife started catching an eye for Joseph. And it says in Scripture, actually, and I want to quote this, um, it, says, it tells us in verse 6 of chapter 39 that Joseph was well-built and handsome. Right? Do you know that not even Scripture says Jesus was handsome? you know that? But Scripture made a point of saying Joseph was well-built and handsome. To give you an idea for the ladies here of why he was so eye-catching. He was a young man, good age, peak age. Um, we don't know much about Potiphar, but apparently um, his wife was, was looking for something different. And it tells us that repeatedly Joseph denied and rejected um, her pushing herself, right? She's telling him, oh, please come to bed with me. Come be with me. Come to this, right? Now as a servant, that could be a pretty dicey situation, right? And Joseph said, no, who would I be to take my master's wife? Not only would I be going against my master, but I'd be sitting against God. And so eventually uh, Potiphar's wife <laughs> had had enough. And she said, you know what? I don't care that you're going to reject me. And she grabbed him to bring him to bed. And it tells us in uh, Genesis 39 that he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. It goes on to tell us in Scripture that even though Joseph did the right thing, God provided a way out for him, right? He provided a way through that door for him to run to, that he wasn't shackled in there. He, wasn't, right? he was able to overcome that temptation and stay true. But it tells us that even doing the right thing, Listen to this. Even doing the right thing, it says, even doing so because he left his cloak behind. This woman took his cloak, screamed that he was raping her. The other servants came running in. The husband came home. She recounts the tale to him. And it says, in a fit of anger, Potiphar threw him in jail. Again, paraphrasing. And there Joseph sat in jail. God provided a way out of the temptation, though, right? Like, how could it possibly be that, God, you provided the way, and I took the way, and now I'm sitting in jail? But as Abraham, Joseph never complained about that. Joseph continued to look to God for provision, right? And so, um, I'll paraphrase real quick. I, I recommend going through the story of Joseph. It's an amazing story if you've never heard it, never seen it. Um, at a different place that put it on. But what happens is that Joseph finds restoration through all of this. By, because he's in jail, he's able to um, interpret the vision that Pharaoh has, and he becomes second in all of the land of Egypt next to Pharaoh. And not only that, <laughs> to make the cherry on top, all those brothers that sold him into slavery, they come groveling for food. And I'll be honest, if my brothers did that to me, and they came asking me for something, <laughs> oh, I don't know. 
I probably would do much what Joseph did, I would hope to say, but Joseph did not get power hungry. He chose to be reconciled with his family, and they all moved to Egypt. What an amazing story of restoration, because Joseph believed in Jehovah Jireh, the God who provided a way out of temptation to then lay the bricks. <laughs> because if he never, um, if he gave in to Potiphar's wife there, and they kept it a secret, and you know, all of that happened, it wouldn't have been set up for him to be second in Pharaoh, right? Second in Pharaoh. So the third and last place I want to look, um, last but certainly not least, save the best for last, is God provides for where it matters in our eternal life. And I'm going to reference a scripture I hope that we all know, John 3, 16. It was, the, in fact, the very first scripture I was taught as a child. For God so loved the world that he gave or provided his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. As a child, it was taught to me for us to remember the gift that Christ was to us. And that we find our eternal life in him, right? And as a child, and, and even as an adult, I continue to believe in that, right? We all do. That is, that is the pillar of, of why we are Christians. But as an adult, it speaks so much more than simply Jesus gives eternal life. I can recognize now that God, as Jehovah Jireh, in the fact that he not only gave his son, but he provided a way out of hell. He provided a way out of the eternal damnation that I deserved. He provided a way out of the death that I earned as a human being. He provided a way to be in his presence forever. He provided a way for us to have a personal relationship with him. A relationship that God desires to have with us. What an amazing, what a, to me, and I, I mention it often, but it is so mind-boggling to me that someone would provide to have a relationship with someone who so easily smacks him in the face. Not only smacked him, but continues to smack him in different ways, right? Whenever we grieve his heart, whenever we slip back, and God just stands there, all forgiving, eternally forgiving. He provides that way for us out of all of that. As we have seen, his provision is never forced upon us, though. Through all of these situations, whether it be eternal life, whether it be temptation, whether it be obedience, there's an expectation upon us to do something with what he provides. We have to utilize the provision we are given. One last story I'll say is that I remember, um, not story, but it's more of half joke, half story, um, of a man who was warned that it was going to flood. And many, many of you may have heard this. Um, a man was warned that he was going to flood. He had, the authorities came to his house. He said, sir, listen, in the next coming days, there's going to be a huge storm, and your house is going to flood. It's going to be underwater. We want to get you out now. We have um, a vehicle to take you out. He said, nope, I've prayed about it. The Lord's going to save me. Okay. The day before the storm's coming, the water's rising, and they send out a fire truck, and they say, hey, listen, um, we're here. We're going to take you out. This is the last vehicle that's going to come by by road. We want to get you out of here now. Grab what you can to save and come with us. And he said, nope, I've prayed about it. The Lord's going to save me. Okay. The water's rising. He goes to the second floor of his house, and he's got the windows open, and a boat comes by, and they say, Come on, man, you can grab whatever little bit you can get out of there and come with us. We want to save you. He said, nope, I pray the Lord's going to save me. He's on his roof, and the rain's still coming down, and the waters are rising, and the helicopter comes. They drop a line and say, hey, climb up. We're here to save you. He says, nope, I pray the Lord's going to save me, and the man drowns. And he goes to heaven. And he's in front of God, and he goes, God, yo, what happened? I prayed. I prayed to you. I showed that I had faith in you. I said you were going to save me. What happened? He said, man, I sent somebody to tell you, a truck to get you, a boat to pick you up, and a helicopter to drop a line, and you didn't take any of them. So when God provides the provision for us in a way out, a provision through obedience, a provision for eternal life, take it. Take it. Sometimes we get so wrapped up in our prayers that we miss the provision God has provided. Right. 
Right? I know I've been there. Lord, please provide. Someone knocks on the door. Hey, I got just what you need. Hold on, I'm praying. Right? Let's be awake enough to see the provision he's put in front of us. The sovereignty of God in Job 121 is amazing. And I'm going I'm to land there as we, we close out and get to our weekly focus. Um, in Job 121, I wanna, I'm going to quote that in just a minute, but I think oftentimes we miss the sovereignty of God in our lives. And, you know, and I'll tell you, this is something that I can attribute to our brother Anthony and our sister Allison. And, and <laughs> because they remind me, they, they can relate to what a sovereign or a king or a queen is, right? And the respect and the honor that they deserve. Um, them being from England, that they, they understand what comes along with that, right? And although they don't believe that he's the sovereign over the world, it's over our country. And sometimes in America, I think we miss that. I really do. We've had some discussions about this and, and how in America we do misunderstand. We come to God and we say, God, save me and do this and do that. And I have this problem and praise you for that and thank you for this. But we are so used to being God's child that we could just say and do whatever we want in his presence that I think we forget that God is the God and creation of this world, that he is the sovereign king, and he deserves honor, That's and right. he deserves respect, and he deserves our attention. And we have to remember that we are constantly in his presence. Constantly in his presence. If you are a believer and you call yourself a Christian, you have a responsibility to remember that you are in his presence. And so that sovereignty we are told in Job 121, it says, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. So even in his provision for us, even as we saw in Abraham, as he provided a, a son in Isaac, but yet when the Lord allows things to be taken away, yes, he loves us. He wants what's best for us. He has a perspective far deeper than ours. But in the end, whatever his perfect plan or reason is, he's the creator. He is the potter. He is the author. It is his book that he's writing, not our book. Or he is writing our book, right? It is not, and I might get these flipped, and if I do, someone please correct me, but it is not a biography. It's an autobiography, right? It's someone else writing our story is what I'm doing. So our weekly focus this week is let us declare Jehovah Jireh over all of our circumstances. Whatever it is, let's be actively aware of his true provision in our lives. Even when the provision may seem like it is being taken away from, taken from us, that there is a plan in place that requires one provision to be removed, maybe, just maybe, so that a greater provision can be put in. It may not be that God is simply taking away the good that he gave you, but maybe you have outgrown the provision he once gave you so that he now takes it away to then make room for a greater plan, a greater purpose, a bigger testimony to put into your life for you to then affect a bigger group or a bigger sphere of influence that you are coming into. 